Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Matt Storos. Dr. Matt is a pathologist at the lab and has been with us for seven years or so. And what a long time. Not that long. <laughs> Yeah, he's going to do some clinical case on diarrhea. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for attending. Um, I'm following good company here. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Matt Sturrow's diagnostic pathologist. I've been at the lab since 2013 and been a food animal diagnostician since 2016. Um, we're going to have to move fast, I think, so some of this may end up getting cut. So I was asked to talk about diarrhea cases. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so just briefly, I want to remind everybody about what diarrhea is and kind of how you might classify it or why it's occurring. Um, and then I'm going to go through cases. So I have two farrowing case, uh, farrowing pig cases, a growing pig case, and a finishing pig case. And I, because we're up against lunch, we may have to condense some of that down. So when we think about diarrhea, a lot of times it gets classified different ways. You can think about it as, as uh, classified by small bowel versus large bowel. Um, this would be something that's affecting the intestines versus something that's affecting the colon. Sometimes that's helpful, but oftentimes there's spillover effects. So if you have too much um, secretion in the small intestine, the large intestine can't handle that burden. So you can start to see mixed, um, mixed presentations of, of what it is. Another way to look at diarrhea is whether or not it's inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. So some diseases, such as um, a toxigenic E. coli, they don't cause a lot of inflammation. The, the disease is mediated primarily by a toxin versus something like a salmonella where you have invasion and a, a lot of uh, inflammatory response that's, that's causing those, those diseases. A lot of times when we get diarrhea workups, people are worried about this one right here, infectious, right? But we gotta remember that there are non-infectious causes of diarrhea. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about that, um, but just keep in mind that when people submit cases for workup, they're often worried about the infectious version, not necessarily the, the non-infectious. And so sometimes we're just ruling things out. Um, when you think about the mechanisms behind diarrhea, what is it? It's, it's increased volume or frequency of, of diarrhea and often increased fluid in there. So one of the more, Common ones would be a secretory diarrhea. Oops, I got ahead of myself. Secretory, so this would be something like an enterotoxin stimulating excessive release of fluid. Um, there are others, so classic would be like an E. coli. Um, other things like rotavirus, uh, the non-structural protein four can act as, a, as an enterotoxin as well and can cause secretion of, of, of fluid. Um, and then the other kind of broad classification would be malabsorptive. And the malabsorptive can be uh, related to uh, reduction of your absorptive surface area, so a villus blunting or, or atrophy, that can be part of the malabsorptive. There can be issues with um, impaired uh, bile, so bile salts can, can come unconjugated, so you can have issues with excess fats rolling through the, the intestine. And then sometimes if there's issues with the um, digestion of the small intestine, you can have more of like an osmotic type diarrhea in the colon, it's pulling fluid in as those, those larger solutes are going through. So with that, we'll move on to the cases. So for ferry case one, they've got a sow farm. For the most part, they're, they're doing okay, um, but they do have some early scours, so day three and some of their gill litters. And then they're seeing a more consistent day nine to 12 scour that's been low mortality, but high morbidity uh, with kind of whitish to light yellow tasty to creamy feces. So a lot of times what we get is, is not necessarily a pig nowadays, we get stuff in a box. So in this case, the post-mortem examination was done by the veterinarian on farm, and they reported, so they did three pigs, which we want, we want more data points than just one. So one of the pigs had pale intestines with white liquid content, and two of the pigs had dark intestine with scant contents. So what did we receive? We got three sets of fixed and unfixed tissues that were from nine to 10 day old piglets. Um, at uh, UMNVDL, we do more syndromic investigation. So if folks submit uh, a general exam of tissues for diarrhea, we have a set of tests that we usually run for what we think might be common in that age group. So um, that holds true for older pigs. We have a different set of tests that we would run for that. So these cases that I'm gonna go through have a set of diagnostic um, tests to, to go through. 
So I, I'm sure you all have differentials in your mind for what this might be. You're going to love this because there's lots of histopathology in this. I don't have a lot of, I don't have any girls pictures. Most of the time we just get uh, descriptions of what, what's going on. So what we have here are small intestinal segments. Um, these ones are a little bit hard to interpret, but when we look at um, the ones, so uh, Dr. Katuri had a nice picture of these really long finger-like projections. Mm -hmm. They should be extending almost to the middle of the, the uh, intestine here, and they're not. So we have marked kind of villus blunting here. This one's hard to interpret, but we can see similar reductions in the villus height um, there as well. When we look at a higher magnification of what's going on, we can see some cellular debris in the lumen here. Down here is the muscularis. Right here is the crypt region, and these right here are the villi. So these are the absorptive um, structures within the intestine. And when we look at the, the villus tip, these right here, this part right here is relatively normal, but if you look at the tips, they're baculated, and in cases they're sloughing and becoming necrotic. We have retraction here of the lamina propria, so these are the support structures that are pulling all the nutrients back in, and they're helping to keep those those long finger like projections out there, so they're starting to retract here. Um, so that was from one pig. This is from one of the other pigs. So in this case, we have really nice long villi so that we don't have the retraction yet, but we see a change here at the villus tip. We have some vacuolation and really marked degeneration when we compare it to the adjacent, adjacent cells. So we have to interpret this right here in light of what else we see. Sometimes if you've got a, a pig and it's been drinking a lot of milk, you can sometimes see vacuolation or kind of uh, wash out of the stain uh, in all the epithelial cells, and that's relatively normal. But when you see it localized here to the villus tip, that indicates that there's something else going on here. So this is very suggestive of a viral infection that's causing cytopathic effect in those cells. Another finding that was present in one of the three pigs we're looking at colon here. You can tell that because we have multiple loops of some sort of GI structure that are encased here in mesentery. So this is mesocolon, and this projector is not very good. Um, this is pale pink. I'll, I'll tell you that. It looks really good on my screen. Um, so there's mesocolonic edema, and then we have debris here in the lumen. So we'll look at a higher magnification image to see what's going on. Um, so here's a relatively normal part of the epithelium. And here's a part that's not normal. So we have loss and sloughing, so necrosis here of the superficial epithelium. And then these little blue dip dots here are neutrophils right at the surface. So we have <laughs> suppurative uh, colitis with superficial necrosis. And this right here, when you see it in a young pig, is very indicative of Clostridium difficile infection. And so we have evidence of vacuolation, villus tip epithelial vacuolation, degeneration, and necrosis with some villus blunting. And we have microseparative colitis with mesocolonic edema in one out of the three. So we do a set of diagnostics. We did aerobic culture. We had no significant growth on any of those. We did anaerobic culture of the intestine. We had no clostridium perfringens isolated from there. We do a salmonella culture. This isn't really the age at which I would expect salmonella to be a real problem, but we did it, um, and it was negative. We did PCR, so anytime you have a pig level of diarrhea, this wouldn't fit the clinical presentation of an enteric coronavirus, but we did it, it's negative. And then we also do, did rotavirus, so A, type A was negative, type B was negative, and type C. Here we have one sample that's positive, a, a CT of 35, so to remind you again, the higher the CT value is, the lower amount of your target is present in the sample. So just traces of rotavirus type C here, and one sample was suspect at a CT of 38. So the histopathology says there's something going on here. It looks viral. Not all of them had clostridium raised difficile infection, so that's not the, the main issue here. So there's something else going on, and that drove a little bit more investigation. So at this point, we have a PCR to tell us whether or not this particular agent is present. At the time this was diagnosed, we did. So this was a reason to do next generation sequencing. We have lesions. We have clinical disease, but we don't have the answer from our usual diagnostics. So this is porcine sample virus um, enteritis here. So just to remind everybody, sample virus is a Khaleesi virus. It's non-enveloped in RNA. So non-enveloped, it's very hardy in the environment. It's going to be hard to get rid of. Um, and then RNA, it's going to be fairly mutable. And so you're going to get some variation showing up pretty quickly in, in what you're seeing. 
Um, one of the issues with sample virus, kind of like rotaviruses, is you can detect it in the feces of diarrheic and normal, clinically normal animals. And so it's important when you're trying to develop a diagnosis of what is going on, you don't go strictly based on the PCR results. You need to integrate holistically um, everything that's present in that, in this case. So in this case, we've got um, pretty clear evidence that sample virus was causing issues at, at this cell farm. So for case two, this is also another fairing pig case. In this case, we've got increased uh, scours and double the normal pre mortality in piglets in the first week of life. Um, Post-mortem examination was done by the veterinarian and they reported liquid intestinal contents. So we received intestine and colon uh, for, for workup. So we got five sets of fixed and unfixed tissues from two day old piglets. So everybody got differentials for what might cause diarrhea and increased mortality in two year old piglets. So this is the histopathology. What's wrong in this picture? It's a trick question. There's nothing wrong. This is normal. So <laughs> the, the, the end result here um, was is that four out of the five didn't have any significant microscopic lesions. There, there was nothing there to say we have a viral infection, nothing really to say we had a bacterial infection other than one pig had some separative enteritis that was, was segmental. When we did um, aerobic cultures, the one pig that had the separative enteritis did have a non hemolytic E. coli, so that's probably an issue for that pig, but that doesn't explain what's going on in the south farm in general. We did have four of the intestines group, group clostridium perfringens type A. Which again, this isn't the clinical picture that I would expect from a clostridium perfringens type A. Sometimes it's subtle, but this isn't. This didn't quite quite fit with that. Um, clostridium diff uh, difficile, or I should say, clostridioides difficile, was isolated from one of the colons, but we didn't have any lesions to deal with it. So that's uh, six and one half a dozen the other. So now that raises the question. Uh, we did do a salmonella culture again. Two days old, not really shouldn't be real high on your list at, at that point. Um, so again, enteric coronaviruses, that would be one of the differentials to have if you have high mortality and increased um, diarrhea. But in this case, the enteric coronaviruses were negative. We did have some trace rotavirus A, CTs 38 and 39, so right about when we would stop the, the cycles for, for running that test. Uh, rotavirus type B was negative. Everybody's bleeding for rotavirus type C, right? <laughs> oh, wait, that was negative too, okay? So now that, that raises the question, what else might be there? So in this case, we had a PCR for the agent that we're looking for. And so this is Seneca virus A. All five of those intestinal samples were positive, PCR positive with low CTs, between 18 and 23. And this is pretty classic for what we see with Seneca virus A causing diarrhea in piglets, is there's not a whole lot going on there. When we look at it, and again, this image isn't doing it justice, where you see the red dots, mostly in the lamina propria, some down here in the cytoplasm of the crypt cells. That's in situ hybridization signal saying that there's Seneca virus RNA present in those areas of, of the tissue. We don't know exactly why these piglets are developing diarrhea, um, but it is a pretty consistent finding when cell farms are, are uh, especially naive cell farms are infected. So uh, this is picornavirus, non-enveloped RNA virus, same issues as we talked about with um, with uh, sample wires, going to be hard to get rid of. Dr. D's done a lot of work as far as you know the the persistence and, and viability of this particular agent in feed. Um, so it, it does become a problem from that perspective. So we know that it causes vesicular disease in pigs, but it's also consistently associated with diarrhea and pre-weaning mortality, especially in the first week of life. The good news is this is typically short. So when you have a south farm that gets this particular syndrome, it lasts for about one to three weeks, and then it goes away. And we haven't really heard reports of it recurring on, on the farm. So once they develop immunity, it seems to become a, a relative non-issue. Non All right, we'll go through this one fairly quick and the next one fairly quick as well. So this is a grow range pig. This is a nine-week-old nine pig. It had been transported to and then processed into a quarantine facility for a, a biomedical uh, research facility. They reported that this animal was bright, alert, and active. 
However, it had unformed feces with blood and mucus mixed in with it. And so because this was coming into a biomedical research facility, they didn't want it to potentially spread whatever was going on to anybody else. The other animals within the ship were clinically normal. Um, and so they euthanized that animal and did uh, necropsy on site to try to figure out what, what might be causing this diarrhea. So they reported a little bit of blood mixed with the colon contents, and then there was hyperemia or redness to the, to the colon and mucosa. We received fresh and fixed tissues. So what this image is showing you here is a, a colon loop. It's maybe hard to see. Up right here would be a relatively normal part, and adjacent to that we can see this kind of darker purple area. We'll go look at higher magnification on what's going on here. This is not normal. So you can see this not normal area here. You can see not normal area here. You can see not normal area here. So it's kind of a patchy area of, when we look at a higher magnification, this is a relatively normal part of the superficial colonic mucosa. And here we have complete loss or, or it's gone there. So we have necrotic superficial necrosis of the colonic epithelium. And we have a lot of uh, cellular debris kind of streaming out here with some, some use in as well. When we look at a high magnification, this is the lamina propria kind of where it's interfacing with that necrotic area. There's a bunch of neutrophils here. And then it's hard to see these kind of stippled gray blue areas. These are actually large aggregates of a small coccobacillus um, that's invading here into that superficial lamina propria. So my morphologic diagnosis for this was that there's separative and necrotizing colitis that was widely disseminated and had large aggregates. Of, I didn't show you the gram negative, so I didn't do a gram stain. I didn't show you the gram stain. Those are gram negative bacteria that are invading the, the superficial lamina propria there. So what did we do for molecular diagnostics? We did our enteric coronaviruses. We tested for Lawsonia intracellularis, just because when you have bloody diarrhea, um, that's, that's definitely a concern, those are negative. We did culture, so we tested for salmonella. That was non-isolated. We uh, set up brachyspire culture, so we grew a brachyspire burdockii. Uh, does everybody think that that's a, a huge problem? No, not really. This, this right here can occasionally cause a, a little bit of uh, catarrhal colitis, but it's usually pretty mild. Um, you might see a little bit of extra mucin if you get a pig that has a burdockii growing it, but you can, you can find it pretty commonly. So we don't usually aerobically culture the colon, but because I saw those invasive colonies, we set up aerobic culture, and we had a, a moderate growth here of Yersinia androcolitica. So what do we need to know about Yersinia? This is a gram-negative bacillus. Um, it's common for pigs to be asymptomatic, asymptomatically colonized, um, but one of the concerns is uh, for public health. So this is one of the bad marks that undercooked pork can potentially have, is yersiniosis can cause issues with um, GI, or food poisoning, if you will, in, in humans. Um, but in pigs, because it's so commonly present, you, you really need um, multiple things. You need clinical diarrhea, you should have this characteristic lesion of invasion and superficial necrosis within the colon, and then you should have either culture positive or PCR positive results. Most of the time it'll grow um, without, I, I don't know necessarily who would have a, a PCR, we, we don't. And then the last case, four minutes, and not, it, it may not work. All right, so we've got um, diarrhea of blood mortality. There were some unknown worms in the stomach, and that's all I got for history. This is colon. It's hard to see from that magnification, so we'll go to high magnification here. Again, we have superficial necrosis of the colonic epithelium. Additionally, we've got these oval structures right here that are embedded in the colonic mucosa. When we look at that at high magnification, we can find that this is a, a cross section of a worm. So this has a very characteristic structure here in the center. This is its esophagus. So this is where its meals go through, this little white circle right here. Surrounding it, there's a basophilic structure. This is called a stichosome. This is very characteristic of a particular uh, nematode. And then right here, a bacillary band. So this is a, a consistent with an aphasmid nematode embedded in the mucosa of this pig colon. So 
I had some sections of cecum as well, so there was a superficial necrotizing typical colitis with aphasmids. We cultured for brachyspire because that should definitely be a concern if you've got bloody diarrhea in the finisher. That was negative. Or we did PCR for that. Lawsonia was also negative. PED was negative. We cultured Salmonella agona. That's a serum group B4 Salmonella. That doesn't really look like what's going on here. This is probably just a, oh, by the way, we have some Salmonella secondary growing there. There were no brachyspire isolated on culture. We had nothing growing on intestine and fecal flotation. We had Inuria and Cystoisospora species oocytes. And again, this is a finishing pig, so this is this is not very helpful as far as what's going on. So what we have, based on our histology, is Trachyrus suis. So based on the location, aphasmid, and it's a pig. This is most likely Trachyrus suis, also known as whipworms. So this is a direct life cycle. And so it's picking it up directly out of the environment. The pre mating period, and this is long, it's about six to seven weeks after they initially get infected before you will actually get oocysts coming out the other end to diagnose it on a fecal flotation. If you have low levels of whipworms, you don't have a whole lot of problems, but if you have heavy infections, that can cause a lot of damage re resulting in diarrhea, blood in the feces, and occasionally you can get rectal prolapse just because of the excessive um, motility issues there. And this is important to know that often the heavy damage is caused by the larval stages as they're growing and replicating in the mucosa. And so you, you're not even going to pick them up on a fecal flotation. And you may need histopathology again. Dr. Kentucky is happy I said that. So take home points. In addition to the usual rotavirus, PED, E. coli, think about some of these other things when you have diarrhea cases. Um, Seneca virus A, if you've got diarrhea and you increased mortality in the first week of life. Think about porcine sample virus, if you have high morbidity but low mortality, kind of in that eight to 12 day range. Consider enteric ursiniosis, if you've got a mild um, mucohemorrhagic diarrhea that's usually resolving on its own. In this case, we had one that was euthanized because of the facility it was going into. And don't forget parasites, especially if you're dealing with non-conventional um, raising, uh, raising of pigs, uh, parasites are still an issue. If you have any questions, there's my email right there. If, if uh, everybody wants to get to lunch, I understand. You may have more, you know, questions, more questions here. So, thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. What's up? Was that a normal measure? Yeah, I, I, I'd have to check the, if I remember right, they were raised in hoop barns on dirt, but I don't think they were pasture based. But it can still be an issue with them. But, you know, your conventional on the slides that they're not doing a good job getting that fecal material out of it. Because the whipworm only will live for months in the environment. Questions for Matt? Or oh, I see people in the evening, but now I'm lunches. Lunches, call me everybody, James. Well, thank you all for our patience and attendance on the diagnostic session. We'll be back next, next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.